Thank you, Carolyn, so much for being here and sharing about your presentation entitled From Eco-Anxiety to Eco-Empathy. Thank you. Let's see if screen sharing works. It works. That's always so good. I noticed the number of people in the chat who are referencing their animals, their dogs mostly. I'm so sorry, somebody's got a sick dog. I hope your dog is okay. I have a tired dog, I've worn him out. So with a bit of luck, he'll stay asleep on the sofa. But if he joins in, we all know about it. He's been bribed with dog treats. So I work with people as a psychotherapist. So my research is with young people um, all over the world. Uh, but by young, I mean in their mm, children, teenagers, and in their 20s. My psychotherapy practice includes just as many adults talking to me from all over the world about how they feel about the climate emergency and about the biodiversity crisis. And I've been working for more than 40 years in mental health as a social worker, then as a counsellor, now as a psychotherapist, teaching at the university and doing research. So 40 years experience. And I am still being surprised. I am still discovering over and over and over again new things about the mental health impact of the current stresses and traumas that humanity is facing today. So that's the first thing I want to say, that if we think we understand this and know how to deal with this, we are very wrong. And we're also very arrogant. And it's probably that arrogance that got us into this mess in the first place. So we need to have the humility to learn about it. It's an emergent mental health problem. And what that means is it's constantly changing and it's evolving and it's growing. And humanity does not have, uh, I, and I also ought to caveat this and start by saying, I'm really sorry, listening to me is never comfortable. And especially at the start of my talks. So, you know, take a deep breath. I won't leave you in the depths of despair by the end of the talk, that's not my intention, but I would like you to feel some despair on the way through the talk, but not set up home there, not stay there. It's a hard sell to try and encourage people to feel distress and sad, but that is a mentally healthy response to what's going on in the world today. We should not feel okay about this. We do need to learn how to be okay with not feeling okay but it is a feeling distress people call it climate anxiety i don't mind what we call it frankly we've missed the boat on calling it something more sensible everyone calls it climate anxiety and i'm not going to complain about anything that gets people talking about mental health but it's not just anxiety it's multiple layers of distress and confusion and anger and depression and sadness and grief we'll talk more about that as we go and it's human caused. We have created this and we have never created anything on this scale before. And one of the difficulties is, is that we look into our past to look at psychologically, you're only gonna get the psychological mental health from me. We look into the past to think, well, we've dealt with previous threats to humanity, so we can deal with this. We've dealt with anxiety about global wars, famine, tsunamis, current wars, um, Cuban Missiles Crisis, nuclear threat, COVID. We look at those things, no matter how badly we dealt with them at different times, and we use the similar narrative, which is when we get over this, when we get beyond it, when we get on the other side of this, we'll be okay. We can go back to normal. We can rebuild. That's how we maintain hope in the face of loss and grief and multiple threats that we don't quite know how to deal with. 
So that's fine when it comes to those threats because they had an endpoint. Wars have an endpoint. COVID had an end ish point. The problem with the climate and biodiversity crisis is we're halfway through the story of this, these multiple ecological crises, not at the beginning, we're in the middle of the story, but we frequently act as if we're at the beginning of the story. We believe we're at the beginning of the story and that the worst threats are in front of us and they're not, they're here today, but we don't want to realize that. We don't want to wake up to that because for the vast majority of us, particularly in the global north uh, and the west, we will look out of the window and it doesn't look that different. But the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, the amount of biodiversity loss, the amount of multiple ecological crises which are evolving, back to my first point about it being emergent, means even if we went to zero carbon emissions tomorrow, it's too late to reverse this. We can never go back to where we were before. This does not mean that we can't change the end of the story. We absolutely can change the end of the story. We can't do that unless we accept that we're in the middle of the story currently. So this is a roundabout way of saying your eco-anxiety makes absolute sense, whether it's anxiety or depression or anger or frustration. And you only feel this because you care. So you should be proud that you care. The last thing I want to do is remove or reduce or manage or treat anybody's eco-anxiety because it's a mentally healthy response. We don't want to get rid of it. We do need to understand it. And then we can channel it into different forms of action. The last thing we want to do is get rid of it. The pre-existing Western medical model of mental health, which is so pervasive, we don't realize we're even living in it. Um, when we talk about colonization, this is one of the worst things we've done to the world is uh, export and colonize the whole world to think in Western medical model terms about things, which is we have to defeat any physical or psychological health problem. We have to beat them, we have to manage them, we have to reduce them, get rid of them. Worst thing we could possibly try and do with eco-anxiety because it's a healthy response. So half the distress that I hear from people is because the people around them can't understand their distress and don't resonate with it and don't understand it. So then it creates an isolation, it creates an alienation because people don't always understand, they don't get it. The Western medical model is deeply unhelpful when it comes to existential global problems like eco-anxiety. It cannot help us. So anyone who says they fully understand it, or they can manage it, or they can treat it, don't listen to them. Ignore them, run away. As I said, 40 years experience in mental health and psychiatry and psychology, nearly 20 years researching this, and I am only just starting to understand it. And that's what we have to start with. A young woman in the United States said to me, any quotes I use from research participants or clients are obviously disguised and I have permission to use them. In fact, people are quite grateful and pleased that I quote them in talks because they want other people to understand. Young woman in the United States in her late twenties, been talking with her for a while about this. She said to me last year and she really shook me. She said, you know what? She said, I wish I was mad. I wish I was really insane. And I said, really, do you know what you're wishing for? Cause this is not nice. She said, yeah, I wish this. She said, because Dealing with insanity would be easier than dealing with eco-anxiety. Other people would understand that. And it's treatable. It's understandable. Eco-anxiety is devastating to her. Every time I listen, so my, re my work is both research and academic, but also clinical. So I learn a lot from listening to people. And I'm going to share some of that with you. 
So this is not unknown. We have cumulative impacts of climate change in the world today. Record heat waves, wildfires, smoke, melting ice, flooding. And this leads to physical harm, absolutely, but also emotional distress. And it's both direct and indirect. This is one of the first things to really point to is that, and I'm sure nobody here would, would say something as selfish as this, I hope not, but in the global north and global west, frequently people will take reassurance from, it's not that bad for our young people yet. We can protect them. This is not true. And I'm gonna show you why later on. But we have short term and long term, and we have direct and indirect. What we're seeing more and more is the indirect adverse experience observed by witnessing harm caused to others. Reports, news reports showing animals and people fleeing wildfires, listening to stories told by survivors of traumatic events. So you are not protected from the impact of climate distress just because you're not physically experiencing it directly yourself. Like I said, we'll sh I'll show you some more statistics on that in, the, in a minute. And we're recognizing this in mental health terms as a range of things, climate anxiety, vicarious trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder. Although Timothy Morton, the philosopher, uh, academic says we should also be talking about pre-traumatic stress disorder. And I think he's right. And complicated grief. And it's complicated. It's the similar grief to the grief that was often felt around COVID because it's human caused. It's not natural disasters. We're not dealing with natural disasters. We've created this. We also have to look at this historically in terms of past responses to climate change to understand where we're at today, to help us understand the present manifestation of this climate distress and look to the future. So past evidence, climate anxiety is nothing new. Climate scientists, ecologists, conservationists have been feeling this and raising the alarm on this for decades, decades since Silent Spring was published in 1960. We also know that the impact of climate change has been well known and well documented, but there's been a campaign of misinformation and disinformation, which has obscured people's capacity to deal with it. It's not the only reason. It's also political and economic and greed, but we'll come to that in a second. The present manifestation of this is the climate anxiety that we see increasing across general populations. In the past, it was very specific, trained, probably uh, scientists and individuals or environmentalists. Present is now becoming more widespread in the population and particularly for children and young people. And it's significant to understand that for children and young people, it's completely different to how adults feel about this. And that's why my research is with people up to mid, late 20s. Anyone under the age of 24, roughly-ish, don't shout at me, um, they're not culpable in the same way. They haven't got the carbon footprint. They haven't got the economic or the political power. They are developing it, yes, but they are not as culpable or as responsible. Over that age, absolutely. Future difficulties, that's just made me think, I want to read you something, and luckily the book is nearby. Future difficulties, well, we have not got much longitudinal research around all this, um, but we're developing it, and there's some really interesting, terrifying, I promise I won't leave you feeling devastated. I'll give you some radical, uncomfortable hope by the end, but we are gonna start with the bad news because we have to face the bad news. So there was some research published uh, by Nomura and this was uh, conducted following Superstorm Sandy in 2012 in New York. We often don't often get opportunity to do longitudinal research on this. We'd have to wait another 10 years and invite me back, right? By which point, mm, we're not sure what state the world will be in. 
But Superstorm Sandy in New York in 2012, some researchers were able to look at the impact in utero of babies in utero of being of women being pregnant during that storm. And then they were able to measure the impact on those children when they were born and then grew up 12 years later. So this 12 years, so they were experienced this ecological environmental trauma during that storm in 2012. 12 years on, they went back and they measured in girls, they had a 20 times greater risk chance of anxiety and a 30 times greater risk of depression. So when we're talking about the future, we're talking about storing up huge problems in children and young people for the future by the trauma that they're experiencing today. This 10 year gap should warn us. We are now starting to argue that climate change and exposure to climate crisis is the equivalent of an adverse childhood experience. That is the equivalent of being exposed to terrorist attacks or war or child abuse. What that does, even though you might be on the other side of the trauma and the trauma may have subsided, the long-term impact makes you vulnerable to mental health problems for the rest of your life into adulthood. This is a big problem. In Mexico, the air pollution in Mexico, they have now started to measure the impact on people's brains of that continuous exposure to air pollution. And they are recognizing that there are physical hallmarks for Alzheimer's in 99.5% of the population, which includes 11 months old children. Now, physical hallmarks for Alzheimer's is not a guarantee that you'll develop Alzheimer's, but it increases your risk, doesn't it? So again, we need to pay attention. So I want to read you something. We live in perilous times and the perilous of our own making and many of us probably deserve it. So what you can do in the chat is put a note of the year you think this was published while I read it you. Take a guess. We live in perilous times, the perilous we're making, and many of us probably deserve it. But the children and the native peoples of this world and all the other species sashaying around in this great dance of life do not deserve the peril that we have created the ecologist Raymond Dassman says that World War III has already begun. And this is the war of industrial humans against the earth. He's correct. All of us are warriors on one side or another in this war. There are no sidelines. There are no civilians. Ours is the last generation that will have the choice of wilderness, clean air, abundant wildlife, and expansive forests. The crisis is that severe. What's important is you do something now. I'll leave the date that was published at the end, but don't Google it. So I'm sure you're all aware of this, and I promise you I'm not underplaying uh, or minimizing the impact of COVID. I really promise you I'm not. I still have long COVID, which has been devastating. But we have multiple waves, multiple threats that humanity is facing. This is what I meant about humanity's never faced these things. Warfare would be in the same scale as the COVID wave. Why is it different? Well, because with things like COVID or nuclear threat, unless it's really worldwide, we can convince ourselves that there are places in the world that might be safer. Not so with climate change or biodiversity collapse. This is genuinely a worldwide problem. There will be nowhere that is exempt from this. And there will be huge parts of the world that are uninhabitable. And those people have to go somewhere. And there are many countries in the world, the US, the UK, and Europe amongst them, who are, we can hear that narrative around migrants, climate migrants, refugees at the moment, that's only going to get worse. People have to go somewhere. 
Antonio Guterres is one of the only world leaders who's speaking out really strongly and clearly about this, because he can. The IPCC report in February 2022 was when they really started talking about the mental health impact, the psychological impact. He said the facts are undeniable. Abdication of leadership is criminal. The world's polluters are guilty of arson of our only home. So the climate crisis, biodiversity crisis, Timothy Morton talks about this as a hyper object, which means it's too big to see all at once. So we think, okay, what about plastic pollution? You think, all right, yeah, okay. And then someone says, yeah, but no, what about air pollution? You think, okay, right. And then someone says, no, we've got wildfires. And then you think, right. And then we've got ocean oceans heating up and then we've got threats to farming and then we've got flooding and then we've got, just, we can't hold it. Our brains are not equipped for this. It's a polycrisis. And the polycrisis means if we don't deal with every aspect of these crises on a global scale, pretty much all at the same time, we're in big trouble. And it's very difficult to do because what we do is we dissect and separate things out to make them manageable. When people don't feel much about the climate biodiversity crisis, it's not that they're not feeling anything, it's that they're feeling too much. So they shut their feelings down. They have to, to survive. This has to be dealt with on a personal level, it's a family level, it's a social, collective, national level, international and political and planetary, all at the same time. Paul Hoggett was one of the founders of the Climate Psychology Alliance. And he said, we're living in a time when tragedy, which is without precedent is unfolding. We are witnessing catastrophic rates of species extinction. There's just two words there psychologically I want to point to. We're living in it. It is without precedent and we're witnessing it. So we're not talking about something that is in our future or in our past. It's the living within it, which is so incredibly difficult for us because we don't believe our eyes. It's like this. The fish don't see the water they're swimming in. They can't construct an idea of water because it's their environment. It's normal. And this is what is happening to us. The crisis is becoming normalized. Gus Beth was the US advisor on climate, I think, during Barack Obama's government, might have been before. He's a natural scientist. He said he used to think top environmental problems could be dealt with with 30 years of good science. He said, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are self selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And scientists don't know how to do that. I would add to that, I would change that slightly today. I'd say scientists alone don't know how to do that. She's saying, can you give me a hand moving these from the fiction to the non-fiction section, 1984, The Handmaid's Tale, Brave New World, The Trial, The Hunger Games, The Road, Planet of the Apes. Hollywood, literature, poetry, art has been addressing this symbolically, representing exactly this shift in humanity that's been going on for a very long time. So I think I've said this really it's very important to understand that this distress that we feel around what's happening to our beautiful planet is not just anxiety about climate change and biodiversity crisis. A huge part of this is the anxiety that we have that people in power are not taking action on this. For young people and children, it is absolutely linked to adult inaction or adult denial or adult disavow which creates a relational trauma. The very people that we want to elect, whatever your politics, to take care of us are failing to do that globally, politically, economically. Being in touch with external reality is how we measure mental health. Therefore, you're, it's a men, sign of mental health if you're distressed. I would worry about people that were not distressed about this. We've missed the boat on changing the name of this, but really we could call it politician anxiety. 
because it's about investing in people in power and recognizing that they have a responsibility or a culpability and there's a disconnect all of these emotions are emotionally mentally healthy in response to these multiple crises grief and solastalgia solastalgia is very much the grief and the love of place the land the water the trees the rivers Hope and hopelessness is really important. We don't want to split into binary, oppositional, emotional responses. We need to feel both. We have to have hope, absolutely. But we also need to visit hopelessness. We just don't want to stay there and live there. Anger, blame, frustration, all of these. Fantasies of rescue, fine. Apocalyptic fantasies, fine. Don't live there. We will develop defences around this to cope. We need to understand that those are defences. We have to be cautious of this false binary. We have this false binary, which is a way of reassuring ourselves. And people split into one of two extreme camps. They go into the apocalyptic, catastrophic, doom and gloom, nihilistic. It's all over. What's the point? And, you know, set up compounds in Arizona or um, insect farms in West Wales or try and buy land in New Zealand. It's like, right, we'll just put up the walls. Or at the opposite end of that, you've got naive hope and optimism. Carbon capture will save us. Yeah, the government will save us. Nothing to worry about. Don't worry about this. There is a particular group who I'm deeply fond of uh, who believe that at the point of greatest destruction, aliens will descend to the earth and rescue us. I love these people because A, how can we be sure they won't? And B, I don't think that's any different to thinking that technology or the government will save us. You know, if you want to invest hope in them, that's absolutely fine. If that's the way you stay sane. But I would advise against it. Really, what we have to do is tolerate the uncert multiple uncertainties in the middle of the, oh, we can be hopeful. Well, right. You can be hopeful unless you live in the Maldives or the Philippines or Nigeria or India or Bangladesh not so hopeful there those countries are devastated and there's not much we can do Caribbean at the moment not much we can do in terms of saving the whole of that country for the future doesn't mean there isn't a lot we can do this is why reparation uh is so important I talk about this as the we need external activism, of course we do. We need to go out there and do stuff, of course, but we also need this internal activism. We need to come to terms with this range of emotional responses and not split any of them off and say, you should not feel that way. Well, yeah, you should, actually. We should not dismiss any of these emotions. I call this emotional biodiversity. Um, my friend who's an ecologist laughs at me and says, no, it's not quite what we mean by biodiversity, but I'm using it because it's a way of representing this all of these emotions have their place. They're all valuable. Don't dismiss them. In the same way as you wouldn't dismiss the importance of insects or grass or clean air and clean water, don't dismiss sadness and grief. They're valuable. I tried to map the kind of journey that we can go on engaging with this climate despair and in what does it feel like to come to terms with this? And there, so although I told you I was going to take you down at the start of the talk, I do not want to leave you there in the depression and hopelessness, but I do want you to be able to visit that because it is invaluable. We move through it by facing vulnerabilities, uncertainties, grief, understanding, and empathy, care for self and others, sadness. Then we can connect with anger, climate justice, reframing, love, imagining different futures and getting empowered, radical acceptance, coping with these multiple uncertainties, finding meaning. And you're at a higher level of functioning psychologically than when you went in. This is how we build emotional intelligence and emotional resilience. If you try and take a shortcut from eco-anxiety to action, you do not develop the intelligence or the resilience you then crash and burn. It's a hard sell saying, 
make friends with your depression. This is why. Generationally, there's big differences. Um, this was a British Association of Counseling and Psychotherapy survey in 2020. Um, you can look, just look at the numbers. Highest percentage of concern about the climate is under 34 year olds, 61, 60%. And then it drops in midlife. And then it goes starts to go up again towards later life as you head towards your 60s. We do not know why. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this. It could well be that at midlife you're just stretched trying to take care of children, elderly relatives, pay the mortgage, pay the rent. You know, it could be getting divorced. I don't know. It could be. I don't. Th and this is generalizing, obviously, but it's important. It's interesting because most of the CEOs and politicians are in that midlife age group as well. And we don't all feel it the same way. People can have mild climate distress and anxiety where feelings are transient and you can be reassured and focus on optimism and you know recycling will make you feel better i'm not dismissing the importance of recycling but that's mild and not everybody feels this in a mild way so diversity difference and valuing and respecting the different feelings around this are absolutely crucial as you get more upset and more distressed you have doubt in other people's capacity to take action and changing their lifestyle. You become disillusioned. You've got the heat pumps, you've got the solar panels, you've gone vegan, you've got an electric car, and it's still all getting worse, for example. And as it gets worse and worse and worse, it's harder to mitigate your distress or your guilt and your shame, particularly living in the global north and west, and it impacts significantly on relationships. At its most critical, we ha currently have young people who are suicidal in the US and the UK and other parts of the world. And it's not that they want to die. They just don't know how to live. A teenager said to me, he said, I don't want to die. He said, but I don't know how to live in a world that doesn't care about the future of young people. I don't know how to cope with that. It's that relational pain and distress. We argue that that is a form of moral injury, and that's been measured in research in veterans who've come back from war or in medics, uh, particularly following the COVID crisis. You go to war or you go to work as a doctor trusting the message you've been given, and you think you're doing the right thing. And in many ways you are, but you've been also betrayed by the people who are in control. Following the Vietnam War, there was very clear evidence of this. And the same now following COVID. You feel betrayed by the very people who are supposed to tell you the truth and protect you. So I need to cut to the end, but I just want to give you a few figures from the research that we published in 2021. This was 10,000 children and young people age 16 to 25 in these 10 different countries, Australia, Brazil, Finland, France, India, Nigeria, Philippines, Portugal, UK, US. And we asked about three things, impact on daily living, how you felt and what you thought. So if you look at the dark blue purple line, impact on daily living, it's not rocket science. If you're in India or the Philippines, Nigeria, Brazil, impacts on daily living is quite significant. It's high. The UK, US, it's relatively low, 26, 28%. Although actually I would argue that, you know, that's still a very significant number of young people who feel that climate change has an impact on their daily living, eating, sleeping, going to school. Then we asked about emotion. Climate change makes me feel, this is the worldwide figures. And the number one emotional response is sadness, not anxiety. 67% said it makes them feel sad. This is the import back to the importance of grief and sadness and fear. So far, fairly familiar, I suspect. I want to show you some of the impact on cognition, the way of thinking. 55% uh, worldwide, 53% UK think they won't have access to the same opportunities 
their parents have. That's an intergenerational conflict. Family security being threatened, not so much in the UK. 52% worldwide, 39% UK. Because it's not directly physically threatening security so much just now. But now look, eight out of 10, 83% worldwide, 80% UK. We've caught up with the worldwide figure. Worse in the Philippines, think people have failed to take care of the planet. Three quarters or more think the future is frightening. 75% worldwide, 73% UK, 92% Philippines. So the young people in the UK and the US, it's very similar, are not protected from the cognitive impact of climate anxiety, which is that the future is frightening. They're not safe from that. Over half think humanity is doomed. 56% worldwide, 51% UK. Even worse, 48% told us they were dismissed or ignored when they tried to talk about climate change. We wouldn't dismiss and ignore young people talking about mental health generally. We wouldn't, but we do when it comes to climate change because the grown-ups can't stand it. We don't know how to cope with it. Then we also asked about government, and this was in 2021. 65% told us they were government was failing young people. This is the UK figures. Only 28% thought government could be trusted. See what I mean about the intergenerational relational trauma. This is the researchers involved. So I did say I'd give you some good news. What helps? Acceptance, altruism, courage, emotional self-regulation. That stuff is really hard to tolerate, but we need to. Gratitude, humility, humor, mindfulness, patient respect. Short-term suppression, have a night off, eat pizza, watch television. Dance, laugh, but do it short term. Be tolerant. Talk to yourself through this. What helps? Face our denial. Come to terms with the fact we're human. So we're deeply irrational creatures. I'm not going to comment about AI's rationality up against the deep irrationality of human beings. If we were rational creatures, there would be no war. There would be no child abuse. It's going to be interesting. I'm not looking forward to that. We need to get under the surface of our feelings. We need emotion in technical solutions. The University of Bath has me teaching this material to engineering students because they want emotionally intelligent engineering students for the future. We have to confront our narcissistic entitlement in the West, in the North. We might want to do these things, but do we need to? We've got to grieve what we've done confront our apathy, give up some old ways of living, repair our relationship with nature and the natural world. We cannot completely see the future, but we can be imaginal and stay with how uncomfortable this is. And it is uncomfortable. We have to face the multiple uncertainties here and they're not experienced equally. We can't just give people advice and expect them to follow. We've got to pay attention to emotion. Humans are emotional, irrational creatures. We will sabotage anything and everything unless we take our feelings into account. We need to pay attention to the three areas, emotions, thinking, and physical action. Then we can reframe eco-anxiety. I don't want to get rid of it. But I will reframe it into eco-empathy, eco-understanding, eco-courage. This is the radical hope argument. We might be going off a cliff as humanity, but we can go down fighting. Eco-awareness, eco-connection, eco-belonging, eco-meaning. And this has to be linked to the fact that the climate biodiversity crisis is a human rights issue. We are undermining and harming fundamental human needs. And there's an intersection between human rights, climate change, and climate anxiety. And if we subject young people to climate anxiety and moral injury without addressing that, it is 
cruel, inhuman, degrading, and a form of torture. That's it. I've stopped. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was very grounding, sobering, helpful. I mean, everyone has different responses, I'm sure. Oh, thank you so much, though, for sharing. And we we would love to open the space for questions for Carolyn or reflections. Feel free to speak them in too. You don't you don't just have to put them in the chat, although it has been very helpful to have them written, but written and um I'll pick up well while people are thinking about their questions. There's one here from Julie, which I'll start with. How how to have supportive conversations with young people about climate change. Um, and I'm going to quote an eight-year-old, Sophia. Uh, I have to use her name. I'm in terrible trouble if I don't. Um, so when I started this research, I spoke to a lot of children and said, how do we talk with you without terrifying you? Bearing in mind, they probably know more about it than you do. And she said, well, she said, you've got to tell us the truth. She said, because if you don't tell us the truth, you're lying to us. She said, and if you're lying to us, we can't trust you. And if we can't trust you, we can't talk to you about how we feel. She said, but don't tell us the bad news all at once. Tell us some bad news and some good news, then some bad news and some good news, then some bad news and some good news. I love this child. She said, and anyway, she said, I'm not a baby. Right? Children, no, already. I, I went to interview a 10 year old. This was 2017, 2018. I went to interview him one evening and his dad met me at the door and his dad, single parent dad, very close relationship with his son. He said, I don't think he knows about climate change. I said, well, we'll see. I only asked two questions. This child is describing climate change as an alligator that crawls over the face of the earth and it's eating and eating and eating and it's rotting from the inside out and it'll never stop eating. Dad is sat the other side of the room next to the Christmas tree looking traumatized, right? He had no idea. And I'm sat there thinking, this child knows about climate change. Your children know about it, but they won't tell you that they know unless you ask them. The best way to start that conversation is to say, what do you know? Tell me, educate me. I really want to know about this. And I want us so it's not so much talking to them as talking with them and saying this, I want to talk about this together. It's got to be dealt with relationally. The thing that hurts children and young people more than anything else is being dismissed. Oh, we have a tendency to criminalize, pathologize, patronize children and young people when it comes to their opinions, particularly around things like climate change. I wish we could lower the voting age as well to 14, at least. That would help. Right, I've rambled. Well, hopefully some other questions have come in. Yeah, there's a great one from Jared. Go for it. Is there a conversation in your professional community about the collective self-harm being committed by society on itself, similar to an alcoholic drinking themselves to death while failing to acknowledge or avoid their inevitably terminal behavior how can that be collect addressed collectively is that specifically i can't find the question is that specifically around alcohol or is it around other forms of self-destructiveness it's just that i think that's like a metaphor of oh, what okay. we're doing as a society to ourselves the, the sort of collective suicide collective yeah i can yeah. that we're in yeah Oh, absolutely. Uh, and it's, of course, being enacted with increasing rates of psychiatric illness, significant mental illness, particularly amongst children and young people in the West and in the global North. I mean, it, it it's increasing massively. Um, yeah, I'm working with two colleagues in particular, one in the US and one in Finland. We're going to be publishing something about the moral injury and the self-harm and the suicide that we're seeing emerging. We're gonna publish at the end of this year. The key thing I would say here, 
is I have worked quite a lot with young people who have been suicidal around this and they're not now. And often what they need is that understanding, that honest understanding and courage to say, yeah, it sucks. Yeah, this is unfair. It's the unfairness and the moral injury and the not being listened to, which causes the worst pain for children and young people. If we can tolerate that, then it's more tolerable for them. I have no problem with people feeling suicidal. I have a great problem with them acting on it. So yeah, we are talking about this, about how to address it. The trouble is, is when you go out into public and media especially and talk about this, you're accused of encouraging young people to commit suicide and self-harm. And so it's a really sensitive, delicate thing. We have to be very careful about how we talk about it. Oh, I want to thank you. So you. Oh. I just wanted to clarify really quickly because I really